Saturday night is a busy night for restaurants. After a big day out, maybe watching the footy or having a barbecue with family, most people prefer to get into some takeaway. In 1991, the cold April Saturday night meant that Carmen, Carly and Karen Chan were home alone while their parents were working hard in one of their three restaurants. This wasn't unusual for this family. The Chans worked 18-hour days to have a nice home in the Melbourne suburb of Templestowe, and the kids were used to it. A Saturday night home alone meant the three sisters would be watching movies and TV in Carmen's room. They'd all settled down to watch a TV special about Marilyn Monroe when Carmen and Carly decided to go and make something to eat. There, they found a man with a balaclava over his head holding the biggest knife they'd ever seen. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates, and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something, and every week I report on true crime from here in Australia. If that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick, stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. All of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. The Mr. Cruel story, specifically the abduction of Templestowe teenager Carmen Chan, was a huge news story for those of us who grew up in the early 90s. A boogeyman for the media, newspapers were often full of sensationalist reporting about the case, or fear-mongering about children playing outside or walking home from school alone. Over the years, there's been a lot of speculation as to who Mr. Cruel is, or was, and Carmen Chan's murder has never been solved. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Melbourne Marvels website specifically for a lot of the information on the background of this case. We'll talk a little bit more about that website later. Our narrative begins on the 22nd of August 1987. The first actual documented victim of the serial rapist Mr. Cruel is attacked in the Melbourne suburb area of Lower Plenty. Winter was slowly coming to an end and the cold air of a Melbourne night isn't exactly where any of us would like to be at 4am on a Saturday morning. Most of us are asleep, warm and tucked up in bed. For the masked man outside, however, his work was just about to begin. He carefully sidled up to a home, removing a window pane from the living room and quietly making his way inside. He then walked up the stairs to a bedroom, armed with a knife and a gun. He woke up the two people sleeping comfortably in their bed and told them to roll over, tying both of their hands and feet together. Blindfolding and gagging the two adults with surgical tape, the masked man then told them to climb into their wardrobe, locking it behind them. Walking into the next room, a six-year-old boy was awoken by an intruder walking in. The masked man blindfolded and gagged the boy with the same surgical tape that he had used on his parents, and then tied him to the bed. The intruder then walked into another bedroom, where an 11-year-old girl was sleeping. Waking her up, he asked her name, was told it, but later wrongly and repeatedly referred to her as Kate, which was not her real name. He made her brush her teeth and then tied her to the bed. Turning on radio station 3KZ loudly, he then proceeded to physically assault and rape the young girl, pausing only to wander through the home and even eat some cold lamb, biscuits, milk and orange juice from the kitchen. After he finished eating, he untied the young girl and took her to the lounge room, where he assaulted her again. He then took her to a seat in the spare room, tying her ankles together with nylon cord. Over two hours would pass before the masked man left the house, cutting the phone lines, telling the girl to count to 100 before she freed her parents, and stealing $250 cash, a box of rare classical records by the London Philharmonic Orchestra, and a dark blue parka with the label Ecuadorian Shirt Company. The young girl heard the front door close and went to her parents' bedroom, freeing them before going and freeing her brother. Her father fled to the next door neighbor's house where he called the police, who quickly attended and began their investigations. Detectives questioned the 11-year-old girl and was told that the masked man had used the family phone to call someone, telling them to move their children or else they would be next. He referred to this person as Bozo. Checking the family's phone history, there was no record of any call taking place making it the first of a series of red herrings that were used to confuse the investigators. 
She provided a description of the masked man to police, who released a sketch of the suspect. The description of the masked man read, Australian, 178 centimetres to 183 centimetres tall, of slim to medium build with brown, greyish white hair with white spots in it. He possibly had dandruff and his hair was protruding from beneath his balaclava. Greyish, white, bushy eyebrows, aged in his mid-twenties, had a gruff voice, deep, nervous, uneducated, suffered from bad breath, was unshaven with a couple of days growth, oval face, soft hands, possibly right-handed, wearing blue denim jeans, good condition, close fitting, a brown tweed sports jacket, possibly rust coloured, a blue nylon waterproof zip-up jacket, blue runners with white flashes down the side, white soles in good condition, and white cotton socks. His balaclava was navy blue with an open face and some type of material covering the eye area. His gloves were light in colour, yellow, and were of the dishwashing or surgical type. The identity of this victim, the first in the narrative, has never been released at the request of her parents. In the aftermath of Christmas 1988, the Wills family were asleep in their Ringwood home. Husband John had had trouble sleeping the night before and stayed up working on a jigsaw. At 5am, he decided to go to bed. Around 45 minutes later, John and his wife Julie were woken up by a man in their bedroom. Julie screamed and yelled for the kids to run. John Wills had a gun put to his head and the intruder asked him, You gonna be a hero? This masked intruder, wearing dark blue overalls and blue ski mask, was holding a knife in his other hand. John said no. Like the first attack, John and his wife were both told to turn onto their stomachs and they were bound at their wrists and ankles with copper wire, blindfolded and gagged with surgical tape. The intruder told him that he was only there for money. He then cut the phone lines. Taking some money from the bedside table, the intruder walked into the bedroom that the family's four daughters shared, addressing 10-year-old Sharon Wills by name. This man woke up the groggy 10-year-old girl and then proceeded to blindfold and gag her as he had her parents. He stopped to pick up a few items of her clothing and then left with Sharon. The two parents broke free of their restraints and ran into their children's bedroom. Their other kids told them that the intruder had taken Sharon. Like the first case, John had to rush next door to the neighbor's house to use their telephone. And then he got into his car and drove around the neighborhood looking for Sharon and came up with nothing. For over 18 hours, but what must have felt like years, the Wills family heard nothing from the kidnapper and there were no leads from the police. Then, just after midnight, a woman stumbled upon a small figure standing on a street corner, wrapped up in green garbage bags and with a man's shirt over the top. She told the woman that her name was Sharon Wills and that she was taken from home early this morning. A man left me here and told me to go and ring home. The woman called police. The Wills family were reunited and police began to interview Sharon, who was a calm and well-spoken 10-year-old. She recounted that she'd been blindfolded the entire time. This meant that she was unable to give a physical description of the attacker. However, she described him as a soft-spoken man that actually seemed somewhat caring about her. One of the words she used to describe him was gentle, which was especially shocking considering his crimes. He'd given her a Vegemite sandwich, he'd given her milk and lemonade. Sharon also told of hearing low-flying aircraft during her short captivity. Shortly before her attacker let her go, Sharon had been thoroughly cleaned, not only washing off any possible forensic evidence he had left behind, but clipping her fingernails and toenails, as well as brushing and flossing her teeth. Her clothes were removed, likely burnt, with the attacker not wanting forensic evidence traced back to him. She was then dressed in garbage bags and a shirt over the top, before being dropped off on the grounds of Bayswater High School just a few kilometres away from her house, where she walked along the road until she was found by a woman. Investigators were quick to piece this incident to the prior one in Lower Plenty, but they wouldn't make details of that public for quite some time. In the weeks and months following the assault, the Wills family lived in a state of fear. The parents, along with their four daughters, began to sleep in the family's lounge together, refusing to sleep in separate bedrooms for months. They installed a security system and were even given a golden retriever as a pet by a friend. John, particularly, took it hard. He felt like he could have done so much more. Like the first attack, the investigation into finding this serial rapist hit a dead end. Very little evidence was left behind or found, and none of it could be used to find one specific person. The Linus family were rather well-off English expats who had moved to Australia for business in 1986. 
The father, Brian, was a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. They were renting a house along the esteemed prestigious Monomeath Avenue in Canterbury. For context, this neighbourhood had been home to many Australian politicians, public officials. It was a rich area. By July 1990, their time in Melbourne had come to an end and the family were preparing to move back to England. On the 3rd of July, Brian and Rosemary Linus were at a farewell party, dinner sort of thing, being thrown for them and had left their two daughters, 13-year-old Nicola and 15-year-old Fiona, alone at home for just a few hours. Shortly before midnight, the two teenagers were awoken by a masked intruder, ordering Nicola into another room to collect her Presbyterian Ladies College school uniform, and he began to tie Fiona to her bed. The man was armed with a gun and a knife, so there was no chance of either girl fighting him or fleeing. And now, with the oldest of the two bound, this intruder was able to make his getaway quite easily. The intruder said to Fiona, tell your dad to pay us 25 grand to get her back, and then took Nicola, making his escape in the family's own rental car, which was parked in the driveway. 20 minutes later, Brian and Rosemary Linus returned home, finding their driveway empty and their front door open. Concerned, they walked carefully into the house, but only found 15-year-old Fiona bound to her own bed with a ransom message to share. Nicola was gone. Once police were called, they immediately began investigating the crime scene, finding absolutely no evidence. Nicola's kidnapping was done quickly. Unlike the abduction of Sharon Wills, Nicola wasn't returned later that day. Roughly 36 hours after the ordeal, Brian held a press conference in which he pleaded with the abductor and stated his willingness to comply with the ransom demands in any way possible. Whoever this kidnapper was, they'd left the demands, but hadn't left any way to pay the amount. We'd just very much like uh, to have Nikki back uh, with us, obviously. Can't wait to have her back with us. Detectives looked into Brian's business dealings, thinking that this may somehow be related to his work. The ransom must have been personal in nature, but they came up with nothing. Brian had no enemies. So, another red herring. Just 50 hours later, Nicola was dropped near an electricity substation in Kew, just a short distance from her home in Canterbury. Fully dressed and wrapped in a blanket, her abductor had left her outside the utility station and had told her to sit with her head between her legs until he drove away. After that, she removed the blindfold, which she'd been wearing the entire time she'd been kidnapped, and then made her way to a nearby house. And shortly after two in the morning, she immediately phoned her father. Brian had been awake ever since Nicola had been taken, and on her 14th birthday, the family were reunited. Nicola was able to provide the investigators with some details that were vital to their investigation. Most prominent among them was a rough estimation of the man's height, which was roughly 175 centimetres or 5 foot 8. She had guessed this by judging her own height to the attacker when he rushed her from her bedroom to the getaway car, and she said that he was barely any taller than she was. She also told police that the suspect had reddish brown hair and a small pot belly. She told police that she was bundled into the family's rental car and driven a couple of blocks away where she was put into the passenger seat footwell of another car and covered with a blanket. Once they'd arrived at their location, she was walked to a house. The two took only 10 steps in a straight line, never stepped sideways or around anything. She was barefoot and could feel concrete underneath. At the end of her walk, she stepped up three steps to a door. She heard the 10 and 11 o'clock news the next morning. She also counted 11 aircraft flying overhead. She believed nine of them were jets and the other two aircraft were smaller, flying from the same direction, descending on a flight path that moved across her body. This was similar to what Sharon Wills had told police. Nicola and her abductor had heard her father Brian's pleas on national TV. Her abductor spoke to her about it. She was also able to give detectives some vital details they hadn't heard of yet. A description of her abductor's house, and vehicle. The sketches that she gave the police were mundane and plain in nature, but they were of vital importance, especially once word of how she had gotten them got out. Apparently Nicola had been blindfolded for the duration of her captivity, but had been given a few chances to get a glimpse of her whereabouts. This went in direct contrast to threats given to her by the newly named Mr. Krull, who told Nicola, my freedom is worth more than your life. This echoed threats that he'd given to Sharon Wills. Just like in Sharon's case, Nicola had been bathed and cleaned before her release. Throughout her captivity, she'd also been forced into a neck brace fastened to the abductor's bed, which no doubt fed into the fear and panic she must have felt throughout. 
She also told authorities that the perpetrator shouted out to another person a bunch of times while Nicola was blindfolded in a bedroom, but no response was ever heard. Yet another red herring. Police were concerned that the attacks were starting to happen more quickly. From a short two hour attack, to 18 hours, to now 50 hours with Nicola Linus, the attacker was getting bolder. He was also getting more vicious in the way he assaulted the young girls. So now police had the rough height, weight, and somewhat hair colour of the suspect, as well as detailed sketches of his house, the interior of his car, and, based on flight paths, a pretty good idea of where he lived. Surely that would lead to an arrest, right? Wrong. Of course, wrong. Operation Challenge was set up in the midst of these kidnappings and sexual assaults, a police operation intended to find the suspect. $100,000 rewards were offered for information leading to a conviction of whoever had attacked the Lower Plenty girl, Sharon Wills, or Nicola Linus. There were no leads, and on Friday 12th of April 1991, it was announced that Operation Challenge was being scaled down. Remember that date, Friday 12th of April 1991. John and Phyllis Chan were two incredibly hard-working parents that worked approximately 18 hours a day to ensure luxurious lives for their three daughters. Both immigrants to Australia, the two parents owned three restaurants in the Eltham area of Victoria, as well as a handful of other property investments. Two were called Ming's, and one called Ying's, which was the most recent addition. The first two were in Bulleen, full-service restaurant, and Main Road Lower Plenty as a takeaway. The two parents often didn't return home until midnight or so, managing one of their three restaurants. They would often leave their three daughters home alone, trusting their 13-year-old daughter Carmen to watch over the other two. Saturday, April 13th, 1991, remember that date from before? Was the first day of the autumn holidays. It was a mild, fine day after early drizzle with a top of 22 degrees. Sound like a weatherman. At around 9am, 13-year-old Carmen Chan was dropped off at Camberwell Tennis Centre in Bulleen Road by her mother Phyllis for tennis lessons. She was then picked up about an hour later, having a bite to eat with her mother at Bulleen Plaza. Phyllis then dropped Carmen off at the Bulleen Library to study. She was picked up later by family friends, and then her younger sisters Carly and Karen were collected from their Chinese language lessons. They were all then driven to the family restaurant Ming's in Eltham, where they had lunch and dinner and were seen playing outside. At 6.30pm, an employee of the restaurant drove the girls home to the family's sprawling home in Circles Road, Tempestow, where their father John was waiting. John left for work about an hour later, leaving Carmen to babysit her sisters. As I said before, this was pretty normal for this hard-working family of four. After school, Carmen and her sisters would take the bus straight from Presbyterian Ladies College in Burwood, which was incidentally the same school that Nicola Linus attended, to Ming's restaurant in Eltham for dinner they'd then get dropped home by one of the restaurant workers. It is possible that someone followed the girls home from school or from the restaurant on one of these trips. In fact, according to one source, a man had been reported to Doncaster Police by neighbours for sitting in a sedan apparently watching a school bus stop opposite the Chan's house on successive mornings in previous weeks. Another source said that a tradesman had appeared at its door looking for work two weeks before the abduction. One final interesting tidbit in the lead up to this night is that apparently the Chans had recently been forced to turn off their alarm system after a cat kept setting it off. So even though the house looked like a fortress with a two metre fence, electric gate, there was still little security to protect the girls. This was a perfect setup in the dark autumn night for our masked intruder to strike. And so while Carmen, Carly and Karen read stories and watched TV, a man in a green grey tracksuit and brown balaclava spray painted the family car with the words, pay back, Asian drug dealer, more and more to come. Another of his red herrings. All three girls were settled down to watch a television special about Marilyn Monroe in Carmen's bedroom. Carmen was recovering from a case of glandular fever and she was wearing a white nightie with a blue flower pattern. At around 9pm, Carmen and Karen went to the kitchen to get a bite to eat. And then, in the hallway, a man in a balaclava carrying a large knife jumped out in front of both of them. He grabbed both girls by the hair. He then worked his way into Carmen's room, finding Carly hiding behind the door. He forced the two younger sisters into a cupboard and barred the door with a bed. The two younger girls later told police that the intruder had called out, I won't hurt you, followed by, don't do that. By the time Carly and Karen pushed their way out of the cupboard, there was no sign of Carmen. 
Carly immediately rang their father at the restaurant and immediately he rushed home before calling police. Strangely, according to Phyllis, when she asked John what was wrong, he said nothing was the matter and told her to keep working. Police arrived and made their first mistake in failing to establish the Chan house as a crime scene. There were dozens of police walking throughout the house and looking for leads before investigators could begin to look for clues of their own. This ruined any chance of potential evidence being found by forensics at the scene. The large house had no sign of children within, so no yard toys, no playground equipment or anything of the sort. This must have been a planned attack. Tracing his entrance from a cut window screen, police were able to track the intruder's steps throughout the house, including his getaway through the sliding glass door in the kitchen. Aided by tracking dogs, they were able to trace the abductor's steps through the family's garden and tennis court up to nearly 300 metres away at a vacant lot, where he must have made his getaway with Carmen at a waiting car. At around 11pm that night in Elizabeth Street, North Coburg, a man walking along Edgars Creek claims he heard a gunshot. He says that he looked up and saw a man wearing overalls and a jacket standing by a ute with his back turned and a gun in the air. The man did not call police at the time. And so, I've got to stress, this rumour has been unable to be confirmed. The 18 hour return time of Sharon Wills passed. The 50 hour return time of Nicola Linus passed. Hoping to get their daughter returned home safely to them, both John and Phyllis Chan held a press conference roughly 72 hours later. Please, bring my daughter Carmen back to home because all my family love her very much. Carmen, this is your favorite dress. You have to come home and wear it. Come back and dress it. Please, release my daughter. Oh, my family, family love her. Don't spoil my family, please. Days later, the Chan family posted an encrypted letter in the local newspaper using a cipher that Carmen would have been able to decipher, which would have led to a P.O. box where the parents would pay ransom in exchange for the safe return of their daughter. Phyllis even offered herself as a prisoner in exchange for her daughter. Six days after the kidnapping, Carmen's sisters penned letters to be published in the media, begging for their older sister to be returned to help take care of them and help with their homework. They told Carmen that their cat, Mimi, missed her. A force of 160 police door knocked more than 12,000 houses in Templestowe, hoping their questions would jog the memories of the kidnapped girl's neighbours. The most intense focus of the door knock was within a kilometre of Carmen's house in Serpels Road. It took days to sift through evidence from the door knock to no avail. Days, weeks, and then months would pass with no word on Carmen's safe return. The police force spent the next few months running a fine-tooth comb through John Chan's personal and professional life, looking for any possibilities of criminal ties or business enemies. They realised quickly that the riding on the Chan's vehicle was nothing more than another red herring by Mr Cruel, meant solely to mislead the investigation successfully. Operation Spectrum began in the months following Carmen's abduction. One of the largest manhunts in Australian history, Operation Spectrum was a multi-million dollar undertaking that consumed tens of thousands of man-hours, along with many thousands more volunteer hours. Offering a $300,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of Mr. Cruel, posters of Nicola Linus, Sharon Wills and Carmen Chan were posted everywhere, and small A4 size versions were sent to every household in Victoria. We'll talk more about Operation Spectrum in a moment. Peter Allen Reed, a prisoner serving a life sentence for the murder of Stephen Henry, a police officer, demanded $15,000 from Carmen's father, John. He made six telephone calls from Pentridge Prison in July 1991, in which he threatened to kill Carmen if the money was not paid. Reed pleaded guilty to one count of making a demand with a threat to kill, and due to his imprisonment, was never considered a suspect. On the 9th of April 1992, a man walking his dog along Edgars Creek in Thomastown stumbled upon a weird object. He bent down to touch it and was horrified by his discovery of what seemed to be a skull. Returning home to tell his mother and alert the authorities, the police soon discovered what the man had actually found was a fully decomposed skeleton. Dental records were first used to try and provide identification to no avail and then DNA was used, finally identifying the skeletal remains of Carmen Chan. An autopsy would reveal that Carmen had been shot three times in the head, execution style, 
with a .22 caliber weapon. Based on the decomposition of her skeleton, she'd likely been dead for close to a year. Another witness who lived in a house overlooking the area where Carmen's remains were found later recalled having seen a man wearing a hooded waterproof raincoat digging beside a truck on a grey rainy day, although they couldn't say which day it was. Two to three days after Carmen's abduction, the weather was cloudy with a shower or two. Theories have lingered as to why Mr. Cruel murdered Carmen, but that can possibly be explained by Carmen's own mother, Phyllis. Phyllis insists that Carmen was a stubborn girl who would have fought hard and likely learned of her abductor's identity. It's possible she learned who her kidnapper was and paid the ultimate price for it. Carmen herself had told school friends that if Mr. Cruel took her, she would fight back. Operation Spectrum would last for the next few years, costing over $4 million. It was disbanded in January 1994 after detectives had eliminated more than 27,000 suspects, travelled 910,000 kilometres around Australia, conducted interviews in Britain and the US, received 10,800 separate pieces of information from the public, worked 25,000 hours of unpaid overtime and examined 30,000 houses suspected of being used by Mr. Cruel to hide his victims. At the time of Spectrum finishing up, there were 32 suspects that could not be eliminated. While Mr. Cruel was never identified by the task force, Operation Spectrum went on to arrest over 70 people involved in child pornography, a seedy underworld that many believed Mr. Cruel to be involved in. Both Nicola and Sharon had claimed to have seen or heard clues of a camera at the foot of the bed they'd been detained in, and it was an easy step to then believe that Mr. Cruel was involved in the trading of child porn. The trawl through Victoria's seedy side also produced some other unexpected results. 74 people were charged with offences, including rape, incest, blackmail, attempted bestiality, threats to kill, making obscene phone calls and firearm offences. Both Joan Kerner and Jeff Kennett's Victorian governments strengthened legislation regarding sex offenders loitering in areas frequented by children and possession of child pornography. Victoria Police, however, was tainted with serious corruption in the early 1990s, which not only would go on to affect the later investigations into Mr. Krull, but also bring forward many claims of cover-ups. So who could it be? Who is Mr. Krull? And as I've already said, in the months following Carmen's disappearance, police investigated John Chan extensively to see if the abduction was payback related to drug or business dealings, but they declared him to be squeaky clean. Sharon Wills was dropped off near the Bayswater Electrical Substation. Nicola Linus was released near an electrical substation in Kew. Both victims also lived near electrical substations in East Camberwell and Ringwood, while the first victim lived near one in Lower Plenty. Carmen's remains were found near an electrical substation known as the Thomastown Terminal Station. Carmen and Nicola both attended the Presbyterian Ladies College, which was across the road from an electrical substation. These connections suggest Mr. Krull may have worked or posed as a substation employee or lived close by. It's probably a good time now to talk about the Melbourne Marvels website, specifically their Mr. Krull map. It's a fascinating resource that's been created. I've used heaps of it in this episode to try and track the movements of the victims and the suspects over the years. I'll leave a link in the description for you to go back and have a look and please subscribe to their Patreon if you find it interesting or worthwhile like I have. It's also worth noting that the May 2022 Channel 9 documentary on the Mr. Krull attacks plagiarised this website repeatedly, even taking credit for the Mr. Krull map. Over the years, several theories would linger about the identity of Mr. Krull and his eventual fate. While police believe that the abduction and murder of Carmen Chan was his last offence in the Victorian area, there are potentially up to a dozen assaults on children in the mid-1980s that have remained unsolved and almost all of them share a couple of details with the Mr. Krull abductions. So it's possible that Mr. Krull is far more notorious of a criminal than publicly known, but police have refused to release details of these prior assaults or Mr. Krull's alleged ties to them. Another theory that has emerged has been Mr. Krull's supposed ties to the Victorian school system. All four of the assaults and abductions happened during or near school holiday breaks, which lead many to believe that Mr. Krull was an employee of the local school system. This also goes with the knowledge that both Nicola Linus and Carmen Chan attended PLC, and Mr. Krull requested Nicola Linus to bring her school uniform along with her. He also addressed Sharon Wills by her name on the night she was abducted. 
Further interviews with his two living abductees revealed that he liked to refer to them as Missy and lived in a fantasy where he thought the two were married. It's very possible that our suspect spent his working hours among the very children he attacked. In 2010, over 20 years after the original abductions and assaults, a new investigation was launched into finding out details and hopefully identifying Mr. Krull. Task Force Apollo was launched, hoping that newer technology and investigative methods could bring about an answer that prior detectives had failed to find. Members of this task force even wrote to the state's 10,000 doctors, pleading with them to breach doctor-patient confidentiality because they believed Mr. Krull may have sought some form of medical help. Unfortunately, many of the case files were misfiled, unorganised or just straight up missing. In fact, one of the vital pieces of evidence that could have been led to Mr. Krull's doorstep, a piece of tape used to bind one of the victims, was missing. Police could have potentially used that piece of tape to recover DNA from Mr. Krull, but it disappeared while in police custody. This missing piece of crucial evidence, paired with Mr. Krull's tactical abilities and his evidentiary knowledge of forensic evidence, has put forward theories that he might have been involved in law enforcement. It's possible that he would know what investigators would be looking for, which is why he did his best to cleanse his victims of any DNA and remove vital evidence afterwards. Robert Keith Knight was detained in 2013, a man who'd made a living as a youth worker and school volunteer, but had been arrested on two separate occasions for a variety of crimes against children. In 1980 and 1996, Knight had been arrested and convicted for sexual assaults on minors, and a multitude of other victims had come out of the woodwork following his convictions. According to the original Operation Spectrum investigators, Robert Keith Knight was one of their suspects that investigators had been unable to eliminate from contention. He remained a person of interest throughout the following investigations, and in the timing of the Mr. Krull assaults would coincide with his post-1980 conviction release. After being released from prison for his 1996 conviction in 2009, Knight began to amass thousands of child pornography images, and he was later detained in an investigation by Victoria Police. He pleaded guilty, and while awaiting trial, he leapt from a second-story prison railing to his death. More recently, many people have begun to theorise that Mr. Krull himself might have resurfaced and been involved in the 2011 abduction of 13-year-old schoolgirl Bung Sira Boon as that case remains unsolved without an end in sight. We'll likely cover that case in a later episode. In 2016, Melbourne newspaper Herald Sun published a list of the top seven suspects known as the Sierra Files. First on that list is a former university lecturer and convicted sex offender, Dr. Brian Allen Elkner, who admitted to writer Keith Moore in an interview in early 2016 that he is the prime suspect. And after brief stints teaching at Yalorn High and University of New South Wales, Elkner moved to Hampton with his young family and secured a position as a lecturer of French literature at the University of Melbourne in 1972. Between April 1972 and May 1974, he attacked six girls in their homes in Brighton, Carnegie, Elstonwick and Murrumbina. All of his victims, five teenage girls and one young married woman, were tied up, threatened with a knife and assaulted. In three cases, he also cut their clothes with scissors. Elkner was jailed for a period of 10 years in 1974 for committing an act of rape, three counts of indecent assault, one of assault with attempt to rape, and one of assault. His court heard that he had a fantasy about tying up and raping girls. However, he was released from prison in 1979 and moved back to Hampton, where two of Mr. Krull's earliest suspected attacks took place in 1985. In mid-1985, he moved to Thornbury. Throughout the 80s, Elkner participated in several marathons and made a career for himself as a freelance writer. Some of the themes in his writing include references to freedom and the criminal as a hero. Detectives searched Elkner's Thornbury home during their investigation and found a knife and balaclava hidden in the roof, though he claims he was at his brother's wedding during one of the attacks. Elkner was questioned for 12 hours by detectives during Operation Spectrum and is considered more likely than any other suspect to meet Mr. Krull by former Spectrum Task Force head David Sprague. Number two on that list was born in 1950 and lived in Eltham at the time of the Mr. Krull attacks. The father of his former girlfriend still lives at the suspect's Eltham address and recently told the Herald Sun he hadn't seen or heard of him for more than 20 years. After moving from Eltham, he lived in several homes in the Box Hill and Surrey Hills areas. 
He ran a number of businesses in Baldwin and Montalbert North before moving to live in a caravan park in Lake Cathy, New South Wales, after marrying a Canadian woman. He left the caravan park in June 2014 and moved to Canada to live with his wife and has not been heard from since. Number three has changed his name twice and lives in Musk near Dalesford. He spoke briefly and angrily to the Herald Sun journalist covering the story in 2016 before ordering them to leave his property. Number four lived in Baldwin at the time of the Mr. Cruel attacks. He moved from his Baldwin address into his mother's Mount Waverley home following her death several years ago. He still lives there. He confirmed to journalists that he was aware that he was a Mr. Cruel suspect, but denied any involvement in the Mr. Cruel attacks. He said he'd never had any charges laid against him and confirmed that he'd been interviewed although he was quick to remind journalists that 27,000 other people were also interviewed. Number five died in 2015 at the age of 66. He lived in Knoxfield at the time of the Mr. Cruel attacks. He was married with children and grandchildren when he died, worked as a self-employed tradesman, and this is likely Robert Keith Knight, who we spoke about before. Number six lived in Harcourt at the time of the Mr. Cruel attacks, and while he still has that house, Neighbours told media that he spends most of his time in Melbourne and only occasionally returns to his Harcourt address. Number seven lived in Glen Iris at the time of the Mr. Cruel attacks. There's been no answer on the many times journalists have knocked on the door of the Glen Iris address that he lived in 25 years ago. Neighbours say they're not aware of him, he isn't on the electoral roll or in the phone book, doesn't use social media, so it's likely that he's deceased. Further investigations by the excellent website Melvin Marvels suspects that he was Christopher Michael Crowther, who had stalked and attacked six children aged four to seven when he was jailed in late 1992. They stated that Crowther was 44 years old and had lived in High Street, Glen Iris, before his arrest. He had earlier been found guilty of five counts of child stealing, four of indecent assault and two of penetration of a child under 10. However, Melbourne Marvels have said there are major differences between the attacks he perpetrated and the Mr. Cruel attacks. Christopher Crowther died in 2003. The Mr. Cruel cases have remained open with cold case detectives regularly reviewing the investigations. On the 25th anniversary of Carmen Chan's abduction, the reward was increased from $100,000 to $1 million. Mr. Cruel remains one of Australia's most wanted criminals but I'm doubtful we'll ever find the perpetrator who killed 13-year-old Carmen Chan on that drizzly evening in Templestowe in April 1991. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick. Stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. And remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I hope you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there. How is it on swords?